Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session today. I am so excited to introduce you all to our speakers. Um, the purpose of this session is to give all of you attending a taste of the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Uh, the Crossroads Program is a global program uh, for first and family to college students from low income backgrounds in over 115 countries. Um, I am excited to tell you more about the program uh, after we hear from our speakers for today. I'm really excited to introduce Harvard Business School faculty member um, and uh, someone who's been involved with the Crossroads program for the last couple of years, Kristen Fabi. Um, thank you for joining us and really excited to have uh, an amazing, um, really an amazing industry leader here, uh, co-founder and CEO and author of Girl Decoded, uh, Rana El Kalyubi. Thank you for joining us. Before we get started, we'll just show a brief video from our co-founder of Crossroads, Kareem Lakani, about um, the Crossroads program. Someone, I think the audio might be. Is the audio too low? I couldn't hear it, but maybe that was just me. No I audio. I couldn't hear it either. No audio. Either. All right. Kareem has great facial expressions, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I want to get started, and I know we have students. I, 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 I think I can do it now, Chair, if you, if you want oh, okay. to. Go, ahead. go for it. All right. We'll take a beat faculty member at the Harvard Business School and co-founder of the Crossroads Emerging Leadership Program at Harvard University. I would love to invite all young people in the world to consider applying to our program. There are so many problems we face as a planet, as a humanity, in terms of climate change, in terms of healthcare, in terms of inequality, in terms of technologies, in which young people are gonna be critical to driving the change and making all of us better off as a human race. The program is designed to do three things. One is to give you the tools you need to meet your ambitions with regards to the change you wanna have in your societies, in your countries. The second, to expose you to the best thinkers and the best mentors to help you achieve this goal. And third, to have a community of other emerging leaders from around the world to get together to collaborate and solve very important problems in the world. The mission of the Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. But we need to find you as leaders from around the world to participate with us, to learn with us, and to help us help you uh, fulfill the ambitions you have to make this world a better place. I really hope you consider applying. I hope you really hope you uh, you participate. I look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, just before we get started, um, I want to thank everyone joining as well. I know we have students joining from Chile, from Senegal, South Africa, Lebanon, um, all the way to Bangladesh, and I think even Cambodia and the Philippines. So we're really excited to have you all here. Um, and I know you're all uh, very excited to hear from Kristen and Rana. So. Tiara, thank you so much um, for this kind introduction. And Rana, thanks so much for joining us here today. We were sidebarding a little bit before uh, today's conversation. Rana and I have a lot in common. And um, I've been teaching in this Crossroads program since its inception in 2017. And it's just an amazing cause about how to find hidden talent in some of these corners of the globe that oftentimes don't get exposed to Harvard education. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I was thinking about today, Rona, is um, you've kind of made this amazing journey through education into the private sector, and um, you've inspired a lot of people along the way. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what inspired you to go into academia and um, start down this amazing road um, and journey that brought you through to Effectiva towards the end here. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited to be part of, of the Crossroads program. I just joined the Harvard Business School as an executive fellow and, and um, would love to see more diverse students from all over the world be part of uh, the Harvard community. So I am originally from Egypt. I grew up uh, around the Middle East in Kuwait and, and UAE and had the opportunity to study computer science as an undergraduate. 
I was really fascinated by how technology changes the way we connect and communicate as humans and all the opportunities and the economic opportunities that that really um, opens up. Um, so, you know, so did my PhD at Cambridge University. I think you did uh, your graduate education in England too. And then joined MIT as, um, as a postdoc and very quickly realized. So what brought me to MIT was a project to apply my technology, which is artificial emotional intelligence um, to autism, but very quickly realized that there's a lot of commercial interest. And so even though my goal is the at the time was to join MIT as a faculty, I made the jump to the business world and started Affectiva. Um, I'm now um, the CEO of the company and we've been in business for the past um, 11 years and we're on a mission to humanize technology. So I kind of went through this journey growing up in the Middle East, finding my way to the United States and also going from academia to business. But at the core of it is this commitment to lifelong learning and, and you know, education and learning is your superpower. It's, it's the best investment you can make in yourself and, and in people around you and, and definitely do the same with, with my kids. I, I invest in their education. I know it's gonna pay off. Yeah, you know, I mean, education has done so much to shape my own journey. I would have never become a professor if it hadn't been for some key mentors along the way who really pushed me into certain programs, pushed me into doing a PhD, encouraged me when I was feeling kind of overwhelmed. Um, did you have any key mentors along your path? And, and then in a moment, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about what this artificial uh, emotional intelligence is all about. Absolutely. Um, with regards to mentorship, one of the people that have really influenced um, kind of the arc of my career is Professor Rosalind Picard at the MIT Media Lab. She started the field of affective computing. In fact, she wrote the book in 1996. I read it in 1997 in Cairo, and she opened my eyes to this whole new universe, and I ended up working with her at MIT and then co-founding Affectiva with her. And she, you know, she took a risk on me. She, she, she brought on this Egyptian, you know, Egyptian young female student to join her lab and, and then later partnered with me to start Affectiva. I also look up to her as a role model. I can, you know, she's a mom. She's also a very successful scientist and entrepreneur. So it's, it's so important to have role models around you and people who can support you on your journey and have your back. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, one of my key mentors at MIT, um, in fact, my advisor for my PhD dissertation was a mentor and he was a, his expertise was on conflict and emotions. And so I was really interested in strategies for solving conflicts the world over in the Middle East and beyond, as you kind of know from my profile. And, um, and he had this approach, which was really looking at psychology and using the psychology of emotions to understand which conflicts would be intractable and which had certain types of solutions. So with that in mind, tell us a little bit more about um, artificial emotional intelligence and um, what this technology is really all about. Well, you'll, you'll know from, from, your, from your research and background that our emotions influence every aspect of our lives, right? How we make decisions, be it a small decision or a big decision, how we connect and communicate with one another, how we build trust and loyalty which of course ties into our relationships at the individual level, but also at, you know, as, 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 as countries and organizations. So um, I, I had this insight way back when I started at Cambridge that a lot of our communication is digitally mediated. Of course, it's now even more true because of the pandemic. Um, yet the 90% of how people communicate, which is usually nonverbal through your facial expressions, your hand gestures, your body posture, your vocal into all of that gets lost in cyberspace when you're primarily connecting through, um, you know, digital medium, like, you know, like chatting or, or even video, like we have, you know, almost 200 people joining us today, but you and I can't see their faces, right? We can't see their level of engagement. So, um, so I built technology that uses camera sensors to capture all of these nonverbal signals in real time, of course, with people's consent. And there's so many applications of it across many, many industries. You know, I had the opportunity as I was getting prepared for today to have a look at the case um, that you had done together with some Harvard Business School professors. And 
when we think of uh, cases in the context of Harvard Business School, oftentimes they involve a decision point where you have to make some sort of key decisions about the company or about your own path and your own trajectory. Um, and in your case, you know, one of the challenging decisions you had to make uh, involves some of the ethical considerations around the technology that you had developed and what the best uses and most ethical uses for that technology really were. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, how that all came to, you know, I'm sure it came kind of crashing down the minute you realized that there were a lot of commercial applications of this, but how did you sort of go through the process of checking in with what your core values were and how you wanted to use your technology constructively um, for understanding human emotions in a digital context? So I really think that as innovators and as thought leaders in, in the tech space, we are the stewards and custodians of, of this technology. And we've seen so many examples over the last couple of years where technology was developed for one purpose, but there are so many unintended consequences. And often, you know, the folks who are designing and deploying these technologies don't really take the time to think about these unintended consequences and, and, and there's dire consequences for that. So when Roz and I started Affectiva, we literally sat around her kitchen table in her house, just about 30 minutes uh, away from MIT. And we said, okay, there are so many use cases of this technology. How are we gonna decide which business to take on and which business to turn away? And we wrote down a number of core values, which, which to this day steer our decision-making as a company. So one, for example, is privacy. Our commitment to acknowledging that this is very personal data. We consent people. We, we, we make sure people opt in, um, in, in all of our use cases. Um, and we make sure that people get some value in return for sharing this data. That has meant that there's some industries we just don't engage in. And so in 2011, we were raising money for the company and we were literally two months away from not making payroll. We were just running out of money. And we got approached by uh, a, a venture fund that focuses on surveillance. And they asked, uh, they, they said, we're gonna give you $40 million, which was a lot of money for us at the time, still is a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but the condition is you gotta pivot the business to focus on security and surveillance. And we just felt that it was not at all in line with our core values. We turned the funding away as hard as it was. And thankfully we, will, we were able to raise money elsewhere with from investors that shared our vision and our mission. And so I've really used these core values to shape where I take this, not just within the scope of Affectiva, but I've, I'm very vocal around, about the ethical development and, dev and deployment of AI more broadly with the industry. I think it's so important that we as thought leaders take the time to do that. And, and one more thing that I, I know you're very passionate about, the importance of bringing diverse voices around the table to be part of this, right? Um, be it gender, be it age, be it ethnicity, being backgrounds, right? Like we need all of you who are listening in to be part of how we shape this and shape our future. Yeah, I mean, this is actually, you know, Rana, this is like one of the main points of, of Crossroads, which is to get some of these diverse voices and find some of this hidden talent and bring uh, these folks to the table, make them part of the discussion. And as you know, in the technology uh, sphere, in the AI sphere, there's a lot of debate nowadays, not just about the ethics of companies, but whether or not some of these algorithms have implicit bias baked into them. And it sounds to me like um, your company and, and part of your mission and, and your core goals involve bringing and making sure that uh, we're aware of all of the diversity um, involved. And this is also extended in your case uh, to writing, you know, you're not just a founder, you're also an author, you've written a book. Um, so could you give us maybe kind of the back jacket cover of the book a little bit to, to, to pique uh, everybody's interest here? Yes, yeah, so uh, I started writing Girl Decoded uh, about three, three and a half years ago now. It launched last year, right in the midst of the pandemic. The paperback um, launches in April, and I'm excited about that. So it's called Girl Decoded, a scientist's quest to reclaim our humanity by bringing emotional intelligence to technology. And it really is, it's a memoir. It follows my journey growing up um, in the Middle East and, you know, becoming kind of first in academia and then becoming an entrepreneur and CEO. At the same time, it takes you behind the scenes of what does it mean to build emotion AI? And, you know, 
Um, how do you do that? And what are the use cases? And what are the ethical and moral implications in a very in a way that's very accessible? I wanted it to be accessible to everybody in the world, regardless of your background or your experiences. And my hope is that it inspires, you know, especially young people out there who are contemplating a career in technology. I, 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 I do really think it's an amazing field to be in with lots of innovation and potential. So um, hopefully it inspires people. If you had to give any advice, so for some of our, our listeners out there and the people who are joining us, um, we probably have a lot of young people on the call who are keen um, to pursue this type of career path themselves. If you, if you had to give any kind of kernels of advice or any um, uh, you know, accumulated wisdom based on your own experience, um, what would you say kind of some of the most important things uh, have been? I think number one is pick something that you are passionate about. And, and, and become the domain expert in it. And this is where the Crossroads program could be really powerful, right? Because it, it's kind of a, it's an opportunity to explore something that you're excited about and, and structure it and build a framework around it. Number two, I don't know about you, but I have and had a lot of um, like inner voices of inner doubt, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> um, and so don't let, and, and often it's gotten in, in, in my way. So my advice would be, don't let, don't let your own self be the biggest obstacle in your way uh, and find mentors and champions and sponsors around you who can cheer you on when you need it. And then number three is the power of a network. I've really, I wish, you know, if I had any advice to give my younger self, it would be to invest more in my network um, of people I know and my relationships because it opens doors. You never know where it will lead you. Sometimes, you know, you pay it forward. Um, and I didn't do that until, you know, more recently in my career. And so again, the crossroads is an opportunity to, to find like-minded people and it will, you know, it will take you on a journey. You don't necessarily know what the outcome come is or what the output is, but it's, it's, it's usually exciting and, and leads to amazing things. I don't know. How you know, about you? I, you know, I can, I can sympathize, especially with your, with or empathize rather maybe with your first point um, about sort of putting yourself out there and um, kind of not second guessing yourself or needing the confidence, you know, even at this sort of a little bit of a later stage, maybe mid career stage where I'm at now. And I've been a professor for 10 years, you know, sometimes I, I, I second guess myself gosh, am I really, do I really know this stuff as well as I think I do? Do I really have the authority to go out there and be making these kind of arguments and decisions? And um, and it's funny because, I, you know, sometimes I wonder how much of that is gendered. I'll, I'll be totally frank. You know, I wonder how much of that is gendered and I, I wonder how much of that is personality based, but I certainly know, you know, I did get some really great advice. It was probably like three or four years ago. Somebody said to me, strategizing for failure really doesn't get you anywhere. You need to be strategizing for success. And if you're constantly worried, if you said this the wrong way, or if you presented yourself, you know, not exactly correctly in this context, um, you're kind of strategizing for failure. Like what happens if everything goes wrong? Really what you need to be thinking about is what happens if everything starts going right? What are my core values and the things I really need to adhere to when things start going wrong? right for me in my career or in this, you know, in this line of work, whatever it is um, that we all choose. Best. I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it was a very good piece of advice when I got it. So, you know, I'm curious, on kind of a nerdy level as like maybe MIT to MIT or Harvard right. to Harvard. Um, I, I, I was sort of in some of my own work where we try to think about um, I try to think about issues of social cohesion and how we can build empathy between people who have, you know, been in situations where there's been conflict, atrocities, violence, um, you know, really horrible and oftentimes life altering events. And um, I was, you know, a lot of people in my field are thinking about using some of these wearable technologies to tap into the layer beyond what people say on face at face value. So what people are sometimes we have this, what we talk about in surveys is social desirability bias. People won't actually say what they're feeling. It might be a little bit too controversial, not socially acceptable, but you can maybe tap in to people's emotional responses or their, you know, kind of their facial expressions. Um, but then some of the detractors in my field say, well, you know, some of these measures are a little bit noisy. You can't, it's hard to get some of the noise out of these measures. Um, 
Have you been involved in that debate at all? And um, tell me what you think about that. Yeah, so one of our main business units focuses on uh, audience measurement. Um, so we brought our product to market in 2011. It leverages any camera sensor on any device. So you don't have to buy or purchase any special hardware. You just use the camera on your laptop or on your phone to essentially quantify people's visceral responses to content, right? So say you're watching a, a video ad or maybe a Netflix show or maybe kind of video, video that evokes these kind of really powerful emotions of conflict, right? Could be sadness, could be anger, could be frustration, could be uh, contempt, right? Well, we are able to capture these moment by moment at scale, right? You can have thousands of people watch this content you can still use a survey at the end to ask them how they feel about all of this, but, but it's very different than this subconscious emotional response that we often see when people watch this content. So, um, so to date, we work with a third of the Fortune 500 companies in 90 countries around the world. And we have tested, I mean, we have about 10 million facial responses. We've been able to correlate this with behavior like, um, you know, do you actually buy the product? Do you tell people about the product? And I'm sure there's an opportunity to leverage this technology in a political, you know, in a pulsi kind of construct and see if it ties to different types of outcomes, right? Um, so I, I think there's something there. I think there's an opportunity to bring these technologies in kind of psychology and, and sociology and, and so the social sciences um, as a way to capture this response. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think there, there are. And, uh, you know, in some of my previous work, one of the things that we had done was to try to understand the type of appeals that leaders can make to their populations to get people to basically set aside violence and um, look at more collaborative and socially constructive ways of interacting. So what are the type of appeals that people respond to? So when I when I heard about your work and, and read about Effectiva, I thought, oh my goodness, this is one of the things that would be directly um, consequential for the type of research that we do in the field of um, post-conflict reconciliation, transitional justice, uh, peace building efforts. And so we're going to have to um, talk <laughs> offline about some of these uh, synergies. So as we're getting kind of ready to, to wrap up our conversation and open things up to the floor um, uh, for students who might have questions or prospective students who might have questions, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us, you know, what do you, so after this year with a pandemic, um, some people, I've heard all sorts of different things and it's hard to get a read on it, right? Because so many of us are so, so isolated in, in some ways, but we're also more connected than ever. Um, and I've been reading some things that say that the pandemic has kind of made us more empathic towards one another. It's allowed us to kind of, um, because of the public health crisis, because we've all been isolated and affected in some ways, it's allowed us to gain a new perspective and a new level of empathy. Other people think maybe we're growing further apart. Um, given your, your experience and all of your expertise in this field, do you have any insights? Um, does your technology provide any insights to how maybe we've been changed? And what are you super excited about thinking about the future, both for the firm um, and for you as, as a CEO, as a scholar, as a thinker? Um, what's next? So I'll start with the, em with the empathy angle first. Um, so I talk in my book about the empathy crisis. I really think, you know, we've, we, we, we're depolarized more than ever. And I think technology has a has a role to play in that. So, so my mantra is let's humanize technology before it dehumanizes us because I think we can leverage technology to bring us together if we do the right thing, if we design it in the right way. Um, over the last year, I do think that there has been a recognition that we're going through this together even though we're all experiencing the pandemic in very unique and different ways. Um, but, but we're going through it together. So I, I think it has brought people together. I think tech, it, it's also made us realize the power of technology in connecting us. But I would say the quality of the connection is still very coarse. I think um, what this has shown, at least you know, in, in my space, is that there's an opportunity for tons of innovation to improve on the quality of the connections we have um, through technology. Um, so I'm excited about the future. With Affectiva, we're very focused on bringing our technology to more and more industries, spe specifically cars. So we're very focused on the automotive space. Uh, we want our roads to be safer. 
Um, beyond that, there's applications of this technology in mental health, which I'm super passionate about. Um, and generally speaking, I, you know, I've, this process of writing a book has made me realize that my voice matters and I want to share the story. I want to share my story and the story of the technology, hopefully to inspire more people. So I'm definitely spending a lot more time. I don't know how to, yeah, a lot more time just kind of trying to evangelize, <laughs> if you like, and, and, and pay it forward. So well, I, you know, I, We've been the beneficiaries of that here today, Rana. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You're a mom, you're a CEO, you're a thinker, you're an author, and um, we really appreciate you taking the time today. I'd love to uh, open it up. Um, Tiara, I think you're going to help us maybe field a few questions while we still have um, Rana on the line, if that's possible. And then I can stick around and um, answer any questions that our audience might have about Crossroads as a program um, and what it has to offer. Uh, and as well as the application process and then the internships that are involved. Amazing. Well, thank you both so much. That was so engaging, so exciting. And I know there's a lot of energy from the students, lots of questions coming in. Um, Rana, I think, so first we have a, uh, many of the folks joining our call today have been huge fans of your work for a while. So um, I'm, I'm really glad that some of our Crossroads students are already familiar with your um, work. I think the point you mentioned earlier about humanizing technology before it dehumanizes us is something that's coming up in the questions a bit. Um, Abdul is asking about uh, how, how the rapid development of technology can affect nature and how um, right now with environmentalists, there's this sense that technology is the enemy of nature. Um, and can you speak a little bit more about, I know you talked about mental health and psychology, but can you maybe uh, speak a little bit um, on Abdul's question. I know just related, Seline, um, also please correct me if I'm saying your names wrong, um, but Seline is asking about um, how in media there's this representation of artificial intelligence um, deceiving humanity with by manipulating our emotions and feelings. And I think what you're talking about is kind of the reverse of that is how can we intervene in that and, and, and influence artificial uh, in intelligence to, uh, to be more humanized instead of dehumanizing us. Yeah, th thank you, Tiara. Thank you, Seline and Abdul. Um, I think at the highest level, people forget that we are the ones designing AI. Like this is not happening to us. We are in the driver's seat here. We're the ones who are architecting what this world that is AI enabled looks like. And the way I like to look, about it, look, look at it is that it's a partnership. It's not humans versus machines. Um, it is it is how do we leverage and harness AI to improve our lives as humans and take this very human centered approach to how we think about technology and that's I think what's been missing so far um, and, and 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 if we center it around humans first if we think about how can we harness technology to make us healthier happier more productive more connected then I think we land on the on the right equation and then I bring it back to diversity again historically over the last you know, X number of years, it's a very small, non-diverse set of people who are designing technologies that are supposedly going to work for all of us, where guess what? They don't. So the more diverse brains we have around the kind of the thinking and designing table, um, the, the more we're going to find the technology will, will work for all of us. And then AI obviously cuts across all industries. It's transforming everything. Um, and, and in, including, including effects, you know, on, on, on how we connect with nature, how we think about climate, how we think about how we connect with each other and how we're grounded and, and, and yeah, feeling empathetic and connected. Again, I don't think, I think to date technology has, has been biased, hasn't really worked for all of us, but we can change that because we're empowered to do so. Amazing. Yeah, thank you, Rana. I think um, I appreciate you bringing up diversity again in, in your response because that is so, so important. And I think um, many of our, for many of our students here, that's, that's a primary concern of theirs is that how can they bring their voices to the table? Um, so I know we have a student, Javed, from Afghanistan and also uh, Darshan is asking about um, leadership. And I know I'd like to question, pose this question both to you and Kristen, being mindful of time. Um, you both spoke about uh, mentorship. And I think where our students are right now is how can they reach those mentors? How can they find um, affinity networks of students who are 
um, envisioning similar things in their region. And I hope Crossroads can be one platform to connect them to students. Um, but I'd love to hear both from you, Rana and Kristen, about your uh, perception of this. Kristen, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. You know, this is, it's funny, I, you know, I teach at Harvard Business School and I, I'm supposed to be teaching on leadership. And, and I think when I first joined the faculty, I didn't really have um, a philosophy of, of leadership. And it's something that I've kind of developed over the course of the last five years um, at HBS. And it's come down to something pretty simple for me. And I don't know if it's always the most effective, but to me, it feels the most Correct. And that is, I think leadership is kindness, actually. I think leadership is kindness and showing understanding um, to people, no matter what their position is. And so I think oftentimes there's like this a, a sense with leadership that you should be, you know, um, that you need to be inspiring. And I think nothing is more inspiring than actually being kind to everybody that's around you, no matter what their position in an organization or how you come across them. And so to me, that's the primary tenet of, of leadership in, in my own career. Rana, I'd be, I'd be curious to, to hear what your experience is and, and, and what you think. Um, so this is one more area where I think we, uh, we share the same, um, I guess the same values. Um, I've been talking a lot about empathetic leadership, especially in the last year. So leading with empathy first and recognizing that people are going through their own challenges. You know, we're all sitting in front of a Zoom, you know, conference call like this one. You don't really know what's going on around, you know, in, in my life, right? It looks great here, but you have no idea the chaos on either side of this. And I think it's so important that as leaders, we recognize that and we start with a little bit of vulnerability sharing how challenging it is, you know, for each of us and encouraging people to reciprocate. So I, I think it's so important to lead with empathy and kindness, like you said, Kristen, this really resonates with me. Um, I also have to just say, it is so awesome seeing people from all around the world join in. I'm, I'm just scrolling through the questions and people are just, you know, it's a pretty international uh, group here, which is really nice. It really is. And um, so Rana, I think we should probably let you go. We're at, at time. And, um, but I will stick around for uh, students to ask any questions. You're obviously more than welcome to stick around. And I hope that we'll keep in touch. Um, it's been really inspiring to hear from you and about your journey today. And uh, it's just been such an honor to have you here as part of this event for Crossroads. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me and everybody who's tuned in. Apply to Crossroads and hopefully we'll cross paths. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you, Tiara. Bye. Thanks so much, Kristen, uh, uh, for speaking with Rana. That was an amazing conversation and, and I'm so glad we're recording this so I can go back and <laughs> re-listen re to parts of it. Um, I know that uh, many of you still have questions for Rana. Rana will continue to be involved in the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. So please stay tuned uh, if you would like to connect with her, as she said. Um, Kristen and I have both been involved with uh, Crossroads and I know many of you have questions about the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program itself. Um, so Kristen, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna spend maybe 20 seconds uh, kind of giving a brief overview. And then um, while you all have Kristen here, I really encourage you to, to, to pick her mind. Um, she's uh, really, as she said, compassionate and kind as a leader. And also um, I think as a faculty member, really excited to continue to get to know all of you. Um, so the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program is a fully funded academic and leadership development opportunity for students who uh, come from low income backgrounds and are the first members of their family to attend university. Um, so we believe that talent is equally distributed around the world, but money and resources are not. And this can often turn education from a propeller of talent and, and growth and, and progress into a funnel. Um, so Crossroads seeks to intervene in that kind of uh, uh, generational attainment gap by connecting students who, who don't have um, the resources, the affirmation, the support networks and mentorship uh, to reimagine their academic and uh, professional futures. Um, through the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program, not only can you connect with mentors like Rana, Harvard faculty like Kristen, but I think most powerfully, you can see in our Q&A all of the students from all over the world who are joining us today from Brazil, from Chile, uh, Senegal, South Africa, Afghanistan and Cambodia. Um, these are these are your peers and these are the students who can affirm you and encourage you and who you will go on to change the world with. So that's just a little bit of background about Crossroads. Kristen, um, I guess I can continue posing questions to you about the program. 
um, if that sounds good. Sure, um, yeah, I'd be happy. You can uh, ask questions and I'd be happy to answer them. And then um, if anybody else wants to chime in in the discussion or if you see uh, hands come up in the next uh, five to 10 minutes or so, um, we can take those questions as we go along as well. Great. Um, so I know, so Shafali, I think, is a student from South Asia, and I uh, know we had a student um, from Uganda, I think, who was talking about being a medical student, and Shafali is a humanities student, and um, so we have a lot of students in the room, not only from different places, but different disciplinary backgrounds as well. And I think the, uh, something that's really exciting about Crossroads is that inviting um, students from different disciplinary backgrounds from the room really cultivates a different kind of conversation. And maybe, you know, you and Rana experienced that a little bit just now, too, so can you speak maybe towards how, um, what the effect is of having humanity students, medical students, engineering students all in the same room and how hearing these different uh, disciplinary perspectives can, can encourage each student's personal um, and academic pathway. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so Crossroads is a leadership program, um, but leadership is not confined to any one discipline. Um, that is one thing I, I know for certain. And I think, you know, as, as the years go by, I think we're realizing that some of these traditional disciplinary boundaries um, are, are more, you know, they can be helpful in structuring thinking, but when it comes to actually making leadership changes in the world, they oftentimes hinder more than they help. And so one of the things I liked most, or I do like most about the Crossroad curriculum um, and the Crossroads student body is that we have students not only from an international spectrum, but we have students from across disciplinary backgrounds. Um, and the cases that we teach in Crossroads uh, and the material that students get access to in Crossroads is also interdisciplinary. So I remember in previous years, I once taught a case um, about macroeconomic policies and resource management in Chile. Uh, and then the next day I taught a case about measuring happiness um, in Bhutan. Uh, we had Tarun uh, Kana, one of our founding uh, members of the Crossroads program taught about music um, and heart surgery all together in the same week. Uh, and we can bring these ideas together and really think about some of the most pressing problems because the most pressing problems today, if you think about them, the environment, um, conflict, uh, disease, illness, they don't know disciplinary boundaries. Um, and so it's best to have these kind of interdisciplinary conversations, I think. Yes, um, amazing. and and. Um, once Kristen, Kristen is, it will join us for about seven more minutes, I think, and then she'll log off. And then um, for all those with further questions, more concrete questions about what exactly you will be getting, um, I can take those on after. But I saw a really interesting question um, from an attendee who's remained anonymous, um, but uh, uh, they're asking about imposter syndrome. And I think that's a question that really applies to students who come from low income and first and family to college backgrounds. And can, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think I think this is I think this is a real issue for 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 many for many people. And so, you know, I myself um, I don't come from a super privileged background. So I went to a public school and made my way up through the public school system in a small town on the west coast in the United States. And um, I oftentimes joke I didn't even know what Harvard University was when I was applying to go to university it was and now I teach at Harvard University and so um, there is the there are these moments in your life where you sort of take a step back and think oh my goodness you know how, how did how did I get here but it's uh, I think you know one of the best ways to 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 conquer imposter syndrome if there is such a way is is through practice um, and is through meeting people like you who are passionate. And so, you know, if, if you set your mind to something and you work on it day in and day out, at some point you will get to the stage um, in your practice of that particular thing, whatever it may be, if it's music, if it's art, if it's social science, if it's um, technology, if it's medicine, you will get to a point where you've put in the time, you put in the hours and you know <laughs> um, that you've learned some things along the way. And so part of it is about, uh, you know, I think just diligence. Um, and, and being diligent in, in, in your practice of what you are passionate about and committing the time um, and energy to it uh, on a regular basis um, and, and not letting self-doubt sort of get you down. Yeah, amazing. Um, that was really good to hear from you. And I think just to follow up on the diligence and passion point, I think having a program like the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program uh, makes it so that if you share your diligence and you share your passion with us, we will provide you with the affirmation and the resources and the network that will continue to kind of 
it's hard to unlearn imposter syndrome, but we will work our best um, to our semifinals and finals and everyone who's in the program. You deserve to be there and you deserve your voice at the table and, and we will do everything on our uh, end to support that. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, Kristen, I think we have time for one more question. Um, there is a couple lined up, but if you have seen anything in the Q&A that you would like to mention, um, you can pull that out. But otherwise, um, one student is asking about what you see in leadership at Harvard and in the corporate world today, um, and what you would like to change about the way we, we perceive leadership. And maybe you can speak also towards how that uh, works in Crossroads. Yeah, so I mean, I will go back to, I think we're living through a pretty transformative moment in, in human history on a number of levels, um, the pandemic aside, but especially one in which I think there's a broad acknowledgement that we need to bring a more diverse set of voices to the table um, in all aspects of work and life. And one of the challenges I've seen is that I think people recognize that, but affecting that change um, in organizations is very difficult. And it's oftentimes almost a generational process or it's a process that takes time. And there's a tension between wanting to see that change affected immediately um, and, um, and, and wanting to see that change happen now um, and having the patience to kind of watch that change unfold. And so, um, you know, as somebody, uh, academia and even political science, my field was long dominated by a certain group of people, a certain subset of society, and we're trying to talk about problems, social problems um, that affect everybody. And I think we're realizing that we can't solve those problems or speak about those problems intelligently without bringing a diverse group of people to the table for solving them. And you know, I've also found that in my research on um, post-conflict reconciliation and reconstruction. So oftentimes people would say that certain people shouldn't be at the peace bargaining table because they're gonna spoil the process. Um, and what my research finds is that no, actually you need kind of a representative set of actors in society. And I think Crossroads is trying to basically bring that representative set of actors um, to unleash hidden talent on a global level. So the other transformative change now is this change in, in the global nature of almost everything we do. And we're in this fortuitous position to be able to um, bring global voices and diverse global voices to the table. So that's what I see as kind of um, the leadership challenge that Crossroads had set out to solve. And now it's um, up to all of you in the audience uh, today to help us solve that. So please apply to the program. And I look forward to seeing you in the classroom um, uh, this summer. Amazing, thank you so much, Kristen. I think, uh, yes, our, you can continue to meet Kristen and, and uh, learn from her and as well as our other faculty members and mentors like Rana um, throughout the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Our application is due on March 22nd. It only takes 15 minutes to complete and you can continue to attend events like this as well as a variety of other resources. Kristen, if you don't mind, one of my favorite things you said is that um, in your uh, classrooms with Crossroads students, there's so much that you learn that you also take back to your um, HBS classrooms. And, and I think that's so powerful. And I think really speaking to the kind of generational movement of transforming our ideas of leadership um, and how we approach different disciplines, like you were just talking about. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me and um, looking forward to seeing everybody in the Crossroads classroom. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Good to have you here. Uh, for folks with questions about the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program, so if you have questions about your eligibility, if you have questions about um, <laughs> any, anything about the program, maybe you haven't heard back from us, I'm happy to take those kinds of questions now. I know we have a couple of them lined up. Uh, we're responding to some. If you submit your question in the Q&A, we will uh, potentially type an answer, uh, or um, I can just uh, kind of go through um, and answer them out loud. Um, I see Anman, we have an alumni of the Crossroads Emerging Leaders, an alumnus of the Crossroads Emerging Leaders program here. Thank you so much for joining us, Anman, and, and we look forward to staying in touch with you. Um, I will uh, go ahead and look at uh, some of the questions now. I know we had a question about um, the Harvard X courses and what kinds of disciplines those are on. Um, so we have five Harvard X courses that we will be offering to free for all students who qualify for this program. So. Um, if you're on this call and you're a first generation, a low income student, uh, just by completing our 15 minute form, you will get access to these five free courses that will come with the Harvard X certificate that you can use on your resume that you can show to future graduate schools. Um, the five courses, they span an array of disciplines. If you're interested in the humanities, 
We have a course called Digital Humanities. So that looks at, um, it's a pertinent question from today because everything's online. So the question is, how can we use digital tools to answer historical question, uh, questions? Um, we have another course on entrepreneurship and emerging economies for those of you coming to the program with a business lens. If you have more of a health lens, if you're interested in medicine or public health, we have a program about strengthening community health worker programs around the world. If you're more quantitatively minded, minded we have a, a course about probability. Um, and also if you're interested in entrepreneurship, again, we have a course uh, taught by one of our, uh, the co-founders of our program on launching breakthrough technologies. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Abhishek has asked a question about how can Crossroads uh, connect us to people who are working in the fields about which you are curious? Um, Abhishek, that's a great question. That's actually the main purpose of the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. So uh, today in this session, you got to meet Rana, uh, who is uh, not only um, a CEO, but also really committed to uh, di diversity and leadership in academia. Um, you got to meet Kristen, who works in, in conflict resolution studies and is also a professor at the Harvard Business School. But I think most importantly, you are all able to connect with each other. Um, you are all young leaders from around the world, and I'm sure you all have similar questions about how is the world going to change and how can you change the world around you? Um, and I think that that Crossroads is a platform to, to make all of these kinds of different connections, as well as connect you to free educational resources. Um, so thank you for that question, Abhishek. Um, uh, just looking for another question. So, uh, Rocio, uh, correct me if I'm saying your name wrong, but Rocio is asking about what kind of resources provided by Crossroads will help you decide and reimagine your career path. Um, I think the biggest resource is that we are connecting you with each other, um, which is an experience um, that I really can't uh, de-emphasize. The, the things that you will learn from your peers from all around the world um, will really transform your perspective on what is possible for your academic and professional futures. And alongside that, Harvard faculty and industry leaders and mentors will step in. Um, in terms of concrete resources, again, we have free Harvard X courses for all of our qualifying students um, with certificates that you can use. Uh, for our semifinalists and finalists, we have internship and mentorship opportunities. So um, the internship opportunities will be in regions. So if you're in Latin America, if you're in the United, in the United States, if you're in Africa, if you're in South Asia, we have specific um, internship opportunities laid out for you in your region. Um, and for our finalists, we can also provide funding opportunities. Um, you can receive a smaller grant that you can use towards um, uh, doing an internship that you identify or to support a small language study or to support travel that you may need to do um, to open yourself to the possibilities of, of the world beyond your home country. And if you are interested in social impact, we can also provide a grant of up to $10,000 um, to one of our Crossroads, to a, a few of our Crossroads finalists uh, to, to run a community initiative in their hometown that addresses a pressing structural issue. Um, so Rosie, I hope that was a helpful overview of the kind of resources that Crossroads can provide that will not only help you decide a career path, but can also encourage you to uh, change and, and explore new worlds and, and um, again, connect you to peers from all over the world. Um, Fernanda uh, is a student who is studying international relations. So in our application, we uh, request you to provide a, a description of the career choice that you have selected. Um, please just, uh, please just uh, select whichever one fits best. You don't have to uh, select the most perfect answer. That most aligns with what you want to do, um, but just uh, the best fit is okay. It, your answer to that question will not um, affect your acceptance to this program. Um, Sayed is asking about what are the key aspects that determine whether a candidate is accepted or rejected. And so Kristen spoke about this a little bit. The best advice I can give you is diligence and passion. Um, so if you're diligent about your application, you will receive so many resources from our team. Um, you might not even know what to do with them. So just uh, be mindful of the program deadlines, be mindful of the resources we are giving you and what you wanna do with them. That's a key to success. And then passion. So we know that low-income students, um, in, in our experience with low-income students, you may not have the best grades, you may not have um, the, the most internships on your resume. None of that matters. I think sharing your passion and showing us who you really are and believing in yourself and believing that this program can support your academic aspirations um, is, are, are, are 
are possible and that CrossFit can help you get there. I do want to say there are no, technically no rejections from the program. Um, once you are accepted, if you are low, if you come from a low income background and you uh, are a first member of your family to attend university, you will receive benefits from, from our program. And the first three stages of the program are completely self-selected. So as long as you finish a Harvard X course, you have access to the next stage of the skills assessment. As long as you do the skills assessment, you will be invited to participate in more live seminars like this with Harvard faculty members and mentors. Um, I hope that answered that question. If you have questions about your specific application, so for example, um, if you have a question about like, my uh, sibling attended university, am I still eligible? The answer to that question is yes, you are still eligible, but a question specific to your applications, you should email us at celpglobal at gmail.com or message us through the submittable platform. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, another student has asked, when is the best time to apply to Crossroads? So the best time is right now. Our applications are due on March 22nd. You have one week to complete the application. The application only takes 15 minutes to complete. I really encourage you to, to apply to the program uh, as soon as you can. Um, we'll be launching our Harvard X courses soon. Um, I also wanted to say that, that the resources that we can offer from the Crossroads Emerging Leaders program are essentially unlimited. And, and I think that's hard to believe, but there's no limit to the number of Harvard X courses that we can share with students, the certificates you can receive. Um, so please share this program with your peers, with your friends, with, with other fellow low-income students, because like Kristen was saying, this really is a generational movement and we really want to empower um, um, students who have been historically disenfranchised as much as we can. You can share these sessions and, and we have the recording, share them on social media, get your peers involved. The biggest aspect of Crossroads is the community. Um, someone has asked, if, is it okay if the documents are not in English? Your documents can be in any language. Um, I know you may have a university transcript that's in French or in Arabic. That's completely fine in Spanish, Portuguese, all of that is fine. Um, please, please uh, go ahead and upload those. Um, in the chat, you can see we have shared all of our social media links and our email address. Um, so please consult us there. Um, Khaled is asking how many Harvard X courses you need to complete to go to the next stage. Uh, you only need to complete one, but you, you will get access to five. Um, so thank you for the question, Khaled. Lucky is asking, how can you make your application unique? Um, I think the main thing is that we just really wanna to get to know you as a person. Um, part of Crossroads is that we really want to affirm you and, and we do believe in you. So uh, please let us know anything that beyond the grades on your transcript or beyond um, what you hope to do career-wise. Um, we really just wanna to get to know you as a person. So thanks for that question, Lucky. Um, Gideon is asking, are internship of, uh, opportunities available for specific areas of specialization or any? Um, that's a great question, Gideon. Just like our program, the internships are provided across an array of disciplines. So for example, uh, we have a partnership with an energy company um, in Brazil. We have partnerships with local NGOs who work in South Asia um, and everywhere along that spectrum. Um, we also have mentors who will be um, providing uh, uh, more close uh, support uh, besides the internships. And those are also across an array of disciplines. So folks who work at Google, um, Harvard faculty members or, or um, any variety of industry leaders or academics. Um, Mohammed is asking, is it better to finish all Harvard X courses or is just one enough? You only need to complete one. And if your time is limited, I urge you just to complete one course well rather than try to complete five courses and, and, and um, feel stressed out. So please just, just uh, be diligent about what is possible for you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, Santiago is asking how many students are accepted into the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Um, that's a great question. Like I said, all of our students uh, receive benefits. So um, I urge you to complete your application. Um, and again, comp competition is, is the exact opposite of what Crossroads is all about. Um, we're really about democratizing and providing resources and encouraging affirmation. Um, so please don't worry about uh, how many other students are in the pool. You will um, receive uh, free resources and uh, mentorship opportunities through your participation in this program. There will be 500 semifinalists selected after that and about 100 finalists 
who are eligible for um, the internship and mentorship and funding opportunities. The semi-finalists have access to the internship um, and mentorship opportunities. And all of our uh, program participants have access to the free Harvard X courses, the skills assessment, and more sessions like this with Harvard faculty members. Um, a student is asking how many times you can apply. Um, you can apply, uh, if you applied last year, we're, we, you can definitely apply this year again. Um, there's no limit on, on previous applicants. Um, and if you're not accepted this year to the semi-finalist or finalist round, you can also um, apply again next year. Um, someone has asked about proof of, of participation in this program. Um, if you complete a Harvard X course, you will get a cert certificate that, that um, proves your participation in Crossroads and also in the Harvard X course. Um, uh, another student is asking, is there a limit of attendees for every country? Like I've said before, we have an unlimited amount of opportunity that we can share with students. So there's not a limit of attendees per country. Um, that's a good question. Um, Mohammed is asking about, uh, uh, Mohammed is a student who applied previously and, and, and did not, uh, was not selected as a finalist. I think the best advice I can give you is that, um, your goal coming into this program should not be specifically to make it to the final stage, though I think um, your, your enthusiasm and energy is definitely something that can get you there. Um, and it also doesn't mean, several of our finalists in the past have been previous applicants who did not make it. And then um, in, in subsequent years, they've applied and succeeded. But I guess, like I've said to, to other students, the goal is really, if we can get to know you as best as possible, understand your passions and curiosities. Um, that would be great. So we only have about two or three more minutes. Um, I know there are many, many questions I did not get to. Um, so if you have questions that are specific to your application, please write to us at celpglobal at gmail.com. Um, you can also message us on social media. You can connect with us on LinkedIn. I'm going to open the chat really quickly. Um, on the chat, you can share your um, LinkedIn if you want to connect with each other. Um, also, if um, someone has created a WhatsApp group for this session, please link the WhatsApp group um, in the chat. And, and um, I'm excited for you all to connect with each other. Um, you will hear, if you have already applied to the program, you will hear back from our team within the next two weeks. We really want to get you all started on Harvard X courses as soon as possible. Um, and again, I know someone has a question about the certificate for the program. You will get a certificate at the Harvard X round um, of, the, of the program. Great, our team will stay online, just looking for more. Uh, Vasco is asking about questions, um, uh, asking question about how to apply for an internship. Um, the internships will be made available to our semi-finalists and finalists uh, once they are selected. And, and we will provide um, insight on the application process then. Thank you for your interest in the, in the internships, Vasco. Um, Jitendra from uh, India is asking about pursuing further in education after this program. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, many of our students go on to pursue graduate school either in their country or abroad after participating in the Crossroads Emerging Leaders Program. Um, and many of our students also go directly into working. So there's really a variety of ways for you to, to take your leadership skills um, from this program into the world after. Um, just want to double check that we've answered uh, as many as possible. Um, someone uh, is asking about how do we craft the program to ensure the optimum impact? Um, that's a really great, great question, I think. But that's also a question about community. Um, the most effective way we can run this program is, is if you're all in conversation with each other and encouraging each other. So I hope that you step away from this session with the sense of um, how you will be able to interact and learn from students from all over the world. Um, I know like you can send in the chat if you're interested um, where students are joining from. We have students from Brazil, Afghanistan, Cambodia, and everywhere in between. So. Um, the community, I think, is the most uh, effective impact that we have. It is, uh, it's been an hour of this session. Um, I know there's a lot of questions remaining. Um, we're so excited for your enthusiasm for the program and our team is here to support you 
at every possible step of the application process. So please write to us or uh, message us on social media. You can also share the social session on social media. Um, it was really wonderful getting to hear from some of you. And I, I hope that we have an event uh, sometime soon that we can all see you at again. Our application is due on March 22nd. The links are in the chat. Please go ahead and fill that out 15 minutes and you will unlock uh, so many free resources uh, and mentorship opportunities and potentially internship and funding opportunities. So don't miss out. It only takes 15 minutes. You can do it from your phone. You don't need a desktop computer to complete the application. I am really excited to uh, uh, get continue to get to know you. We have a couple more events happening this week. Um, on Friday, we will be having an application completion party for those of you who are lagging a little bit on completing it. We also have information sessions where you can hear from alumni of the program uh, two or three times this week. Uh, thank you all so much for joining and I'm really proud of you for putting the time into to, uh, coming to the session. Uh, and again, it was really wonderful to hear from Rana El Kalyubi. Um, the title of her book is Girl Decoded um, and we've sent that in the Q&A and uh, from Kristen Fabe, who is a professor at the Harvard Business School, uh, who you will see involved in the CrossFit program for months and months to come. Thank you so much. And um, Saman, is there anything else from our end? No, that was